I bet you've seen this photo. It's actually about a decade old, and it's another example of people showing their love for an oppressive regime. The later half of 2022 saw widespread and violent protests all over Iran. Given that event, I decided to reference Iran here as well. In the 16th century, Nostradamus predicted that a dictator would meet his demise in 2022, and ironically, uh, this very year we've seen many uprisings against dictators in Russia, China, and even Iran now. In a lot of cases, this is how they might begin to collapse. But getting back to the photo we saw at the beginning of the video, we should ask the question, has the Iranian regime oppressed more than just its own people with weapons? Have they spread beyond their borders? Uh, is this meme false? We can easily argue that it is. The Persian empires have been involved in many conflicts for the last two millennia, but okay, okay. To not nitpick, let's go get a view of all the attacks and bombings Iran has done on other nations and their assets since the Second World War, as it's stated here. During the Iran-Iraq War, the two belligerents got involved in what was called the Tanker War, starting in 1984. Iraqi jets attacked Iranian shipping with the goal of causing Iran to deliberately close the vital strait of Hormuz and cause an international disaster in order to get the world's largest powers involved. The Strait of Hormuz is a stretch of waterway that is only 48 kilometers wide. It's the only way to travel between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman by ship. The most important aspect here is the Persian Gulf, which has coasts of eight nations. But more importantly, this region produces a third of the world's oil, and the only way for them to exit by ship is through this narrow strait. 15% of all the energy that humanity consumes goes through here. That's why it's so important. Iran limited the retaliatory strikes and chose to leave the strait open. However, it did proceed to spread the war further. Starting on May 13, 1984, the Iranian military started attacking unarmed tanker vessels, first from Kuwait and then from other Gulf nations, fearing that they were transporting Iraqi oil. Neither Iraq nor Iran designated any safe zone for oil ships to pass, and so a large number of foreign vessels were attacked, causing mayhem to the global economy. In 1986, tankers from Kuwait began to register their ships under U.S. flags. Although Congress was critical of the idea, there was no unified position on it, and starting in 1987, the U.S. began Operation Earnest Will, where the Navy would escort tankers out of the Persian Gulf. Even so, uh, Iran still pressed its attack on shipping in the area. On July 24th, the Kuwaiti oil tanker, the al Raqqa, which was reflagged as the MV Bridgerton, struck an Iranian naval mine, resulting in more naval forces being deployed to the area. More than 30 ships were used to support the operation in the region, and parallel to Ernest Will was Operation Prime Chance, which was launched to stop Iranian vessels from laying mines in the first place. The most famous battle occurred on September 21st, when Little Bird helicopters from the 160th Special Operations Air Regiment attacked the Iranian vessel, the Iran Ajar, after it was discovered to have been laying mines. On October 15th, the U.S. reflagged tanker the Sea Isle City was struck by an Iranian silkworm missile. In retaliation, the U.S. launched Operation Nimble Archer, where destroyers shelled two offshore platforms controlled by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in the Rustam airfield. There were no casualties, but radios and documentation were taken by the U.S. for intelligence. The following year saw the U.S. almost get involved in the war when the U.S. destroyer the USS Samuel B. Roberts was struck by an Iranian mine. In retaliation, the U.S. launched Operation Praying Mantis, striking several Iranian vessels in its territorial waters, making it the largest naval battle involving the U.S. since the Vietnam War. After that, Iranian attacks on neutral ships drastically decreased, and the only major incident after that was July 3rd, 1988, when the destroyer, the USS Vincent, mistook Iranian Air Flight 655 for an Iranian F-14, starting another international incident. The two effects of praying mantis and the airliner's downing helped convince Iran to agree to a peace treaty on July 8th, 1988, ending the eight-year-long conflict. The same for the tanker war. That is the first conflict on this list. Now, moving on to the second one. On October 11, 2011, there was a plot to bomb the Saudi embassy in Washington, D.C. with the goal of assassinating the then Saudi ambassador to the U.S. The FBI caught wind of this and identified two perpetrators. 
Mansour Arbasiar was arrested at JFK International Airport and later sentenced to 25 years in prison. The other suspect, Golam Shakuri, slipped away and is still at large. Some politicians and legal experts claim that this constitutes an act of war, but there was debate on whether or not the act was sanctioned by the Iranian government or by rogue elements of the Quds Force. The Quds Force is a unit inside the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that socializes in asymmetric guerrilla warfare and has been known to operate outside Iran the most. In addition to that debate, Judge Andrew Napolitano stated that this would constitute more of a criminal act rather than an act of war as no violence was committed on U.S. soil due to the capture of the suspect. Nevertheless, the U.S. expanded sanctions on Iran and targeted its central bank, making it more difficult for Iran to sell oil. Number two was right there. To give you some context, the Yemeni civil war started back in 2014. It started in September of that year when the Houthi armed movement attacked the capital. It claims to be the legitimate government of the nation. Naturally, this was disputed by the Presidential Leadership Council and they have been in conflict ever since. But on a much larger scope, this is actually a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran as they try to battle for influence in the Gulf states. But calling it a proxy war is a little outdated, as on one hand, ever since 2015, Saudi Arabia has led a coalition of nine countries from West Asia and North Africa to militarily bolster the original government. This has led to a bombing campaign, a naval blockade, and even a reported figure of 150,000 troops to take part in hostilities. But this has come from the other side as well. Supporting the Houthi insurgency are Iran, North Korea, Libya, and Hezbollah. It has even come to it that the star of this video, Iran, has sent members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps into Yemen to help them fight and to provide advice and additional firepower. They have openly fought with the Houthi rebels against the Yemeni government and Saudi-led coalition on the ground. They have also done so in the air. Believe it or not, Iran is a drone power. Because of international sanctions, Iran has always had to adapt development with what little resources they have. Because they are unable to create large numbers of fighter jets, they shift to something simpler, drones. On a lot of cases, coalition forces have downed some of these drones as they are being operated by both the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Houthis. Naturally, Iran denies this despite the mounting evidence, but it does add another country to the list as they are aiding an insurgency in fighting the legitimate government of a sovereign nation. To continue on with the Iranian drone attacks, another situation rose up in another nation. On February 10, 2018, an Iranian Shahid drone flew into Israeli airspace. The purpose of the intrusion is still unknown. Some say it's to test Israel's air defenses, others to say that it was a recon drone or maybe even a bombing mission. Iran still denies ever sending a drone, so it is really hard to tell. Despite this, fragments of the drone were found and identified to be Iranian. The incident even led to a retaliatory airstrike on a joint Syrian-Iranian base inside the Tias air base in Syria. It was the first time that Israeli and Iranian forces directly confronted each other. <laughs> Two thousand twenty two was mostly dominated by the news of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As many know, Russia has purchased large amounts of Iranian Shahid Kamikaze drones to instigate airstrikes all over Ukraine. But one thing is less talked about. Iranian trainers have even been sent to Crimea where they are teaching Russian forces on how to operate them. It has gotten so bad that Ukrainians in Kiev began protesting outside the Iranian embassy and Zelensky even reduced the number of Iranian diplomats in Kiev. During an attack on the airbase in Crimea, 10 Iranian trainers were even confirmed to be dead. They're that close to the front line and obviously involved in the war. If one were to learn anything from recent history, it's quite obvious that the meme we've seen should look a lot more like this, given all the attacks they have done. Any claim that the Iranian military is unproven is quite mistaken. Even sanctions or an ailing economy have not stopped them from carrying out these attacks. Iran is definitely a nation with a rich history and a lot of economic potential. 
It is held back by a regime that fails to respect the tenets of an international system. That is why certain populists need to see that their role model in the Middle East is not what it seems.